Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, this one has been requested many times. Well, Anthony, why don't you use poetry? So today I'm going to go over the technical reasons why I don't use poetry, but also a brand new trust issue with poetry that I will go into detail at the end. Uh, but anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so my old reasons for not using poetry were basically summed up in two main things. The first is it's not really necessary. And the second is that it makes some incorrect, well, I don't want to say incorrect. It makes some inconvenient defaults for versioning. Uh, let me just show you kind of a getting started with poetry and I'll point out some of the problems that I've run into along the way. And note that last time I did this, uh, I also ran into essentially three bugs in the first five minutes of me trying to use poetry, which steered me away from it pretty severely as well. Now, two of the three have been addressed, uh, so I don't know. Maybe that's not a <laughs> valid criticism. But anyway, uh, let's get started. Uh, we're going to make a virtual env, and we're going to pip install poetry. And this will actually point out the first issue that I have with poetry, and that it's pretty complicated. It pulls in quite a lot of dependencies to do what it needs to do. Uh, you know, <laughs> what? Pip freeze. It essentially needs 50 dependencies to do what it needs to. But okay, maybe you know some of the things have other dependencies and, and that's understandable. 50 dependencies isn't necessarily a problem, uh, but it can quickly become one. Um, but that's, that's again, not, not the actual criticism here. Uh, the first is the decision with versioning in poetry. I'm gonna run poetry in it and just set up a very basic package. I'm just gonna let it use all the defaults and not really uh, mess with it. And we're also going to do poetry add a package. So we're going to add a dependency to our library and uh, it will install it and add it. And sure, that's all fine and dandy. The problem that I have is it's defaults to how it manages dependencies. Uh, if you're not familiar with the caret here on the versioning, uh, this is essentially shorthand for greater than or equal to 3.8 and less than four. Uh, the same is true for uh, config v here as well. I believe this one is greater than or equal to 3.3.0 and less than 3.4.0. It might also be the major version. Either way, uh, what this implicitly does is it adds less than qualifiers to all of your dependencies, and that's the default behavior. Uh, and the problem I have with this is if you're working with libraries and you install a bunch of different libraries, you're going to run into conflicts over and over and over. Uh, one example of this that has really frustrated me in the past is the requests library, which very carefully selects its dependencies. Uh, more like an application and less like a library, even though requests probably fits into the library category much more than it does the application one. Uh, and this means like whenever URLib3 or any of those other libraries bump, you have to manage a whole bunch of conflicts between all of your libraries that you may have. Uh, and so I think this, this caret versioning it kind of makes sense for applications. I don't even think it makes sense for applications, but uh, <laughs> it frustrates me a lot. I think it's a really poor choice of defaults. That's kind of the, the, the biggest technical reason. The other is, I just think it's not really necessary. Uh, PIP has a dependency resolver now, so if we uh, virtual env vm, you know, if we have our very simple requirements.in, requirements.in, with our dependencies in it. Uh, I usually like to only use greater than or equal to or not even bother and just allow it to go to the latest. So, so let's say we had, you know, config v, pre-commit, uh, pytest, added some dependencies in here. We can pip install requirements.in. Pip will now manage all of the conflicts. Oh, dash r. <laughs> pip will manage all of our conflicts for us. We can pretty easily do pip freeze dash dash all to give us our requirements.txt. And then when we need to install things, we can install from this frozen requirements file with all of the dependencies we need. Uh, and there's also tools that automate this. My favorite one of these is pip tools, which does this process kind of magically for you. Poetry also does something similar to this with its poetry.lock. But I think, you know, just using pip is way simpler than pulling in 50 things to do essentially the same thing. But anyway, that's not what today's video about. Today is about how the maintainers of poetry have 
done some pretty severe damage to trust via a deprecation approach. I say deprecation in the loosest form of terms because it wasn't really a deprecation. It was more of a breaking change without any sort of notice. Uh, and we're going to jump into that and kind of describe what happened here and why, to me, it is so eroding of trust. Uh, so the basis of this, and it has been reverted, so there's there's been some, you know, outcry and, you know, fixes of this, but I think that it was proposed and approved and merged and released by two of the core devs of poetry kind of concerns me a lot. Uh, but anyway, let me describe to you what this quote-unquote deprecation was for getpoetry.py. If you're not familiar with getpoetry.py, it's kind of a way to bootstrap poetry, and uh, the maintainers have been trying to get rid of it. Understandably, it's probably not the best way to bootstrap into something. You, know, you might want something like a zip app or some other distributable piece of software rather than a curl Python script, run Python script as root sort of thing. Um, but the intention was to start... Uh, discouraging the use of this getpoetry.py script in version 1.2.0. Uh, specifically, 1.2 alpha 1 was, I believe, the first time that this was truly deprecated. And the way that this was approached was if it detected uh, your script was running in CI, which many CI providers export this environment variable to indicate that they're in CI, uh, what it would do is it would print, it, print this warning, which is great. That's what you should do for a deprecation. You should print the warning. But it would also 5% of the time error, which you should either always error or always not error. A 5% just you know, adding flakiness to a system intentionally, especially in a CI system, is kind of a recipe for disaster. Uh, but the other part about this is if you weren't in CI, it would just outright fail. Uh, you could, of course, work around it with an environment variable, but uh, it would always fail, essentially giving users zero migration time between a thing that worked and a thing that's deprecated and now failing. Uh, now, usually the approach to deprecation that I prefer is, you know, it's working, then the next thing you do is you add a message that indicates that it will change in the future. You allow some bake period for people to recognize the message and change based on it in a released version. Yes, yes, they added this to an alpha release, and I don't think many people actually adopted the alpha release. Uh, but after that period of time has elapsed, then you can remove the original functionality or, you know, make a breaking change. Uh, of course, the exception here is security-related things, and you know, security-related things kind of break the mold of all sorts of semantic versioning and deprecation periods and all that other stuff. Uh, but going from immediately passing to immediately failing is not acceptable. And <laughs> having a random number generator for whether it's going to succeed in CI is certainly a decision. Uh, but I don't know. I'll let you make your own decisions, but I'm definitely not going to use poetry because of this. Um, but, you know, my workflow with pip and pip tools works fine for me. And, uh, you know, you can also get hashes out of pip tools as well. So if you want that part of it and uh, a little bit more, uh, <laughs> you know, sanity in that, in that respect, that's another approach there. But anyway, hopefully you found this interesting. If there are additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.